The incidents depicted in this video occurred in 2008 in Auburn, Alabama, USA. Despite 15 years passing since then, the conclusion to the Lauren Burke case remains unresolved. And before I start the story, I'll ask you to subscribe and click on all the notifications so you don't miss another video. Lauren Ashley Burke was born on December 30, 1989 in Marietta, Georgia. Her parents, James Burke and Vivian Gershon, later divorced. Lauren had a sister, Jacqueline Burke, and a brother, Chad Burke. After completing high school, Lauren attended Auburn University, where she pursued graphic design, participated actively in the Delta Gamma sorority, played lacrosse, and engaged in various campus activities. Known for her friendly demeanor, Lauren was highly regarded by her peers, recognized as an outstanding student. Always cheerful, optimistic, and supportive, Lauren began dating Sean McQuaid while still in high school. They both continued their relationship after enrolling at Auburn University, where they shared aspirations for their future despite focusing on their education. However, not all of Lauren's aspirations were fulfilled as tragedy struck on the morning of March 4, 2008. The day commenced with breakfast at a cafe with her boyfriend, Scene. Following this, Lauren attended her classes and then spoke with her father, James, discussing plans for spring break and a dental appointment. Subsequently, she spent the evening at Xi'an's dormitory until 8.30 p.m., when she had a study session scheduled with her classmate Michael at the library. Around 8 p.m., Lauren left Sean's room, stepping into the darkness of the evening. Her black 2001 Honda Civic awaited her in the parking lot adjacent to the dormitory, and she headed towards it, bidding Sean farewell. Little did he know it would be the last time he saw Lauren. Meanwhile, Michael, who awaited her at the library, grew concerned when Lauren failed to appear for their scheduled meeting. Repeated calls to Lauren's cell phone went unanswered, until finally she picked up. In a surprising turn, she explained that she had forgotten about their appointment and abruptly ended the call. Later, around 9 p.m., a distress call reached 911 reporting an injured girl lying on the road between the Farmville Baptist Church and Route 280 on the 147 freeway. It was Lauren. Concerned drivers halted traffic in both directions, coming to her aid. Lauren lay sprawled on the road, her breaths shallow and labored, her body riddled with wounds, clad only in socks. By 9.12 p.m., the first police car arrived, finding Lauren unconscious. Moments later, paramedics rushed to the scene, loading her into the ambulance as her pulse weakened. At 9.35 p.m., she arrived at East Alabama Medical Center where medical staff fought to preserve her life. Meanwhile, at 9.27 p.m., 911 dispatchers fielded reports of a car ablaze on the Auburn University campus. Responders swiftly converged on the location, grappling to extinguish the flames. Among the throngs of onlookers, police traced the vehicle's owner to James Burke of Georgia, adding another layer of intrigue to the unfolding events. James Burke, Lauren's father, received a harrowing phone call from the police informing him that his daughter's Honda had been engulfed in flames. Anxious for Lauren's safety, James pressed the officers for information, only to be met with uncertainty. They couldn't locate Lauren, and there was no one inside the burning vehicle. Frantic, James attempted to reach Lauren on her cell phone, but his calls went unanswered, intensifying his worry. Desperate for any clue to her whereabouts, he reached out to Lauren's friends, then to her mother, Vivian Gershon, hoping for insight. However, neither had any knowledge of the unfolding events. As the minutes ticked by, Vivian dialed Lauren's boyfriend, Sean, at 9.40 p.m., hoping for answers. Upon hearing the distressing news from Vivian, Sean was stunned to learn about Lauren's disappearance and the burning of her car. Frantically reaching out to their mutual acquaintances, Sean pieced together that Lauren had canceled her library meeting, claiming she had forgotten about it. However, Sean knew this wasn't true. Just two hours prior, Lauren had left his room with plans to head straight to the library. While loved ones scrambled to unravel Lauren's whereabouts, doctors at East Alabama Medical Center fought to save her life. Lauren arrived unconscious, devoid of personal effects or identification, leaving the medical staff in the dark about her identity. Despite their valiant efforts, Lauren succumbed to her injuries, succumbing to a single gunshot wound that pierced both lungs. Forensic experts determined the gun had been fired mere inches from her skin. As authorities connected the dots between the tragic events at the hospital and the charred vehicle on campus, it became clear that the victim, 
unable to be revived by medical intervention, was Lauren Burke. The following day, March 5, 2008, James Burke made the heart-wrenching journey from Atlanta to formally identify the body of his daughter. The news of Lauren's passing swiftly circulated throughout the campus of Auburn University. In response, Auburn University issued a statement addressing Lauren Burke's tragic demise, advising students and staff to exercise extra caution both on and off campus while reassuring them of campus safety. Concerned callers, including students and parents, sought clarification, prompting the statement to emphasize that there were no signs of additional threats to campus or student well-being. The Delta Gamma Society also released a statement regarding what fraternity representatives labeled as an unforeseen and troubling incident. The Society urged members of the Auburn branch to fully cooperate with investigators in unraveling the circumstances surrounding the event. As Lauren's loved ones mourned, law enforcement worked to identify the perpetrator responsible for her death, the connection to the car fire, and whether other students were at risk. The locations where Lauren Burke's body was discovered and her car was located underwent thorough evidence processing. Auburn Police Spokesman Captain Tom Stouffer assured the community of the extensive efforts to apprehend the perpetrator, emphasizing the collective commitment to safety in Auburn, Alabama. Governor Bob Riley offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest in Burke's case. Investigative teams examined Lauren's burned car at the Auburn Police Department, uncovering remnants of burnt clothing, her melted digital camera, and a 38th caliber bullet beneath the front seat, suggesting the car's interior as the crime scene. Despite interviews with Lauren's family, friends, and boyfriend, no viable suspects emerged. Detectives pursued leads, including Lauren's bank card usage post-incident, indicating the involvement of the cardholder in her case. However, developments took an unexpected turn when, within days of Lauren's passing, an African descent man assaulted a 72-year-old woman in a Walmart parking lot 75 miles from Auburn. Attempting to flee, the assailant switched vehicles, prompting a high-speed chase towards Columbus, West Georgia. During the pursuit, the perpetrator discarded a 38 caliber revolver before his vehicle broke down, leading to a collision with a pursuing officer's motorcycle fortunately resulting in minor injuries. The perpetrator halted his escape on a road cutting through a forest, darting into the woods in an attempt to flee. Despite his efforts, law enforcement swiftly apprehended him, securing handcuffs around his wrists. Courtney Leroy Lockhart, born on October 20, 1984, underwent a profound change after joining the U.S. Army, as described by his family. Dispatched to Iraq in 2004, he returned in 2005, fundamentally altered, according to his mother. He wasn't the Courtney I knew, she lamented. Once cheerful, Courtney's demeanor shifted drastically. He no longer smiled, avoided being approached from behind, and occasionally sought refuge in closets or beneath beds. In 2006, Lockhart became a father to a daughter with his then-girlfriend, with whom he later separated. The same year, he faced a court-martial for assaulting fellow soldiers substance abuse, and unauthorized absence from his unit. Following seven months of detention, Lockhart received a dishonorable discharge from the Army in December 2006. As 2008 loomed closer, Lockhart's behavior spiraled out of control. Reports indicated that he neglected personal hygiene, ceased visiting his daughter, and succumbed to heavy substance abuse. Starting in February 2008, he embarked on a spree of burglaries, employing a consistent modus operandi save for a convenience store heist. His method involved ambushing victims from behind as they entered their vehicles in parking lots, brandishing a firearm, and coercing them to surrender their belongings, often attempting to steal their cars. Tragically, one such encounter resulted in the loss of Lauren Burke's life. Lockhart's criminal streak came to an abrupt halt on March 7, 2008, following his assault on a 72-year-old woman and subsequent failure to evade police pursuit. Upon his apprehension, 23-year-old Courtney Lockhart confessed at the police station to the abduction and murder of Lauren Burke. The recorded interrogation served as crucial evidence during his trial, further bolstered by the discovery of Lauren's personal effects. 
including her iPod and bank cards, in Lockhart's vehicle. Lockhart provided a detailed recollection of the events leading to Lauren's abduction. On Tuesday, March 4, 2008, Lockhart awoke in his silver Chrysler Sebring, having spent the previous night near East Alabama Medical Center. Driven by financial need, he prowled Auburn in search of another victim, exclusively targeting women. His pursuit led him to Auburn University's campus, where he parked adjacent to the student dormitories. For hours, Lockhart observed students from his car until around 8 p.m. when he spotted Lauren approaching a neighboring vehicle. Without hesitation, Lockhart armed himself with a revolver and approached Lauren from behind. Pressing the gun's muzzle against her, he demanded to know her available funds. Upon receiving no response, Lockhart forcefully ushered Lauren into the passenger seat of her car, assuming control of the vehicle himself. Lauren remained silent, but her screams of fear echoed in the car. When she finally managed to compose herself, she retrieved $200 from her purse, offering it to him and pleading for him to depart. Instead of leaving, however, he commanded Lauren to disrobe. Under duress and amidst menacing threats, Lauren complied, shedding all her garments except for a pair of socks. Lockhart asserted that his intent behind coercing Lauren to undress was to hinder any potential escape, believing that without clothing she would be less inclined to flee. With one hand gripping the wheel and the other brandishing the gun, Lockhart navigated the streets of Auburn. Despite Lauren's efforts to dissuade him and her promises to aid in finding him employment, Lockhart remained resolute in his actions. When Lauren's phone rang, Lockhart instructed her to fabricate a story to quell suspicions, the call originating from Michael, whom Lauren had intended to meet at the library. She hastily excused herself, claiming to have forgotten about the appointment, and terminated the call. Their journey continued through the city streets, with Lauren persistently attempting to reason with Lockhart, offering assistance to alleviate his troubles. As they traversed Highway 147, Lauren made a desperate attempt to flee flinging open the car door while it was in motion. It was then, Lockhart claimed, that a shot was inadvertently discharged, resulting in the tragic outcome we now comprehend. The discharge bullet penetrated both of Lauren's lungs, compounding the injuries she sustained from the fall. Despite her waning strength, she managed to signal passing motorists before succumbing to unconsciousness. Lockhart recounted to investigators how he parked outside a church, observing as vehicles halted beside Lauren, sprawled on the asphalt. Anticipating the imminent arrival of law enforcement, he hastily absconded. Intent on erasing incriminating evidence, Lockhart proceeded to a gas station, purchasing a can of gasoline using Lauren's bank card. He proceeded to saturate the interior of the car with the purchased gasoline, before embarking on a perilous drive to the campus where he had abducted Lauren, his Chrysler parked nearby. Lockhart claimed that the gasoline fumes induced dizziness, prompting him to roll down the windows for ventilation. The decision not to directly douse Lauren's car with gasoline on campus raised questions, considering the inherent risk of ignition due to potential electrical faults or sparks. Speculation arose regarding Lockhart's mental state or cognitive limitations though further examination was deferred. Upon reaching campus, Courtney absconded with $46, an iPod, and Lauren's bank cards from her car before igniting the vehicle and departing in his Chrysler. Subsequently returning to the gas station, he again utilized Lauren's funds to purchase fuel before revisiting the campus to ascertain the extent of the car's destruction. Investigators began to scrutinize the veracity of Lockhart's testimony entertaining doubts regarding his alleged motives for compelling Lauren to undress and the circumstances surrounding the discharge of the firearm. Given Courtney's military background and proficiency with firearms, it appeared improbable that the shooting could have been accidental. A more plausible scenario suggested that Lauren recognized the futility of negotiation with Lockhart and opted for a daring escape. She seized the opportunity, flinging open the car door and leaping to freedom only to be met with gunfire from Lockhart. Ballistics analysis corroborated that the bullet recovered from Lauren's car matched the firearm discarded by Lockhart during the police pursuit, dispelling any notion of inadvertent discharge. 
Forensic experts confirmed that the trigger had been deliberately pulled with sufficient force to discharge the weapon. On March 9th, as Lauren's loved ones bid her a final farewell, investigators conducted a second interrogation with Lockhart. The subsequent day, Lockhart faced formal charges related to the Lauren Burke case, marking the commencement of his legal ordeal. The trial convened on November 8, 2010, with Lockhart's defense asserting his mental instability stemming from military service, contending that Lauren's shooting was unintended. Lockhart entered a plea of not guilty by reason of mental defect or insanity, supported by testimony from a psychologist who attested to Lockhart's subpar IQ and combat-related symptoms, albeit without PTSD diagnosis. Despite attempts by the state to introduce evidence of Lockhart's prior offenses and military misconduct, the trial judge deemed such evidence inadmissible. Following the guilt phase, the sentencing proceedings ensued promptly. Lockhart's defense sought to portray him as a troubled war veteran, deeply affected by combat experiences and the loss of his commanding officer. However, the jury unanimously recommended a sentence of life without parole, while the trial judge, in a dissenting opinion, sentenced Lockhart to death. The judge's rationale, outlined in a comprehensive sentencing order, emphasized the severity of the kidnapping offense, underscoring the random and defenseless nature of Lauren's selection as a victim. The abduction becomes all the more reprehensible considering it occurred on a college campus, a supposed haven where students anticipate safety and Lauren was coerced into her own vehicle. Lockhart's coercion, compelling her to disrobe and holding her at gunpoint to prevent escape, compounds the gravity of the offense. The court underscored that the jury remained uninformed about Lockhart's series of criminal activities and the complete the scope of his military service. Thus, by receiving testimony regarding Lockhart's service, the jury remained unaware of the entirety of Lockhart's military disciplinary history, as noted by the judge. The court speculated that had the jury been privy to these additional details, their sentencing recommendation might have diverged. Fifteen years have elapsed since Lauren's tragic death, yet Lockhart remains on death row in Alabama, relentlessly pursuing avenues to appeal his sentence. Following his conviction and subsequent death sentence, Lockhart initiated appeals within the Alabama court system, which upheld the sentence in August 2013. Despite Lockhart's appeals, the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals denied his retrial request in April 2014. Subsequently, Lockhart appealed to the Supreme Court of Alabama, only to face rejection of his motion in September 2014. In January 2015, Lockhart sought relief from the Supreme Court of the United States, but his petition met denial in April of the same year. In 2018, Lockhart mounted another challenge to his sentence, with lawyers from a human rights organization arguing that his 2010 defense team mishandled the case. Despite noted flaws in Lockhart's defense, they did not alter the outcome and the death sentence stood reaffirmed. In April 2021, the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals upheld Lockhart's death sentence once more. Lauren's parents said they would never give up and would do everything in their power to keep Lockhart's death sentence from being overturned. Courtney Lockhart gave my daughter the death penalty. There's no reason why he shouldn't have the death penalty. That's all I have to say, Burke's father Jim said. He didn't give her a second chance. He shouldn't get a second chance either, Lauren's mother Vivian said. As of today, Courtney Lockhart remains on death row in Alabama.